Good afternoon, John. John Donovan. Hey, Marty Keller, uh, Sacramento. Cohorts and psychological crime here. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this version of the Intentional Living podcast. In this podcast, we work on breaking down patterns of behavior that that I say I don't want and seem to end up with anyway. Right. There's there's uh, there's some psychic energy inside that. Uh, I find myself uh, or that that results in me doing things I say consciously I don't want. And yet somehow I keep doing them. Uh, oftentimes this is called addiction, um, but the addictions uh, often can be seen in terms of behavior. So today uh, we want to take a look at that. We want to do a deep dive into that addictive energy that lives within us that was was uh something we developed as young children as a result of for most of us a result of post uh, a complex post traumatic uh, post traumatic stress syndrome complex ptsd which i call the trauma of a thousand paper cuts mm -hmm. there's two kinds of trauma that we deal with one is the the obvious immediate dangerous loud life-threatening trauma that is normally associated with the battlefield or right. violent crime or sexual abuse those kinds of things where something unexpected uh, intervenes into our lives and causes huge disruption for most of us though in childhood we we experience uh, nothing hugely dramatic but an endless series of small traumatic experiences where something about our experience is violated mm -hmm. and so as a result of that we talked about this uh john in a couple of podcasts ago when you went over the uh, obstacles uh to uh to what we want uh that you use in your uh in your display and so i thought today for this podcast we would focus on you know how does that happen and, and why is it so persistent and then in the our next podcast, we're going to talk about the opposite of that. We're going to talk about the joys of freedom. But mm -hmm. today we're going to talk about the joys of addiction. And uh, so with that introduction, I'd like to open up and see what your thoughts are. Um, yeah, my um, compulsive addictive patterns um, had a payoff. The the drinking got me out of my own self-criticism, although I didn't know, um, I couldn't explain it that way. All I could tell you was, I like to drink, I feel good, I get happy. Uh, and um, um, I was the kind of drinker that if I went ever, ever went out into something public or party or people, um, I, I would have two beers before I leave the house just to, and then make sure that where, whatever the venue was, I had access to some kind of alcohol. Um, so the payoff was, it just made me feel good. Um, even though um, the end result of the continuous drinking was um, persistent feelings of isolation alone, um, self-doubt, uh, self-criticism. Um, and beyond the, the, the substance addiction, uh, one of my addictions or patterns of behavior was, um, um, I term it as like rageaholic. In other words, I'd scream and yell or raise my voice to prove a point. If I got an argument, I would uh, use my stature, posture, loud voice. Um, to prove a point and the payoff was that i was right i i yeah i i, I was working in the jail one time and we had this um, scenario set up and um as a role play and the person playing the role play decided that whatever the situation was he's going to go get his gang and fight these guys you know and somebody's going to die and I asked him, I said, what price are you willing to pay to be right? And and he said, whatever it takes. It was like no brainer. It's like, no, I'm right. They're wrong. I'm going to get my friends. We're going to have to, we're going to beat each other up. Or I'm going to beat them up. So the payoff was that I, I was right. 
I had this thing where I, I didn't really know how to articulate it at the time, but it was too embarrassing or devaluing to be wrong. So um, I even have a, a question that I ask people to kind of prove uh, that we have this internal motivation to to a pattern of behavior is that if, have you ever been in an argument and the middle of the argument got that you're on the wrong side and then continued with your argument anyway um and that that was my experience i would be in an argument and it's something dawned on me oh oh uh, uh and i wouldn't stop I, I would double down i'd make a personal i would deflect just so i didn't have to say oh my bad i was wrong um and I would continue the argument. Um, so that's one of the payoffs is that I was right. Um, can we, and can we, probably, go ahead. Can we uh, dig in that a little bit deeper because it's very parallel to experiences I've had. And as you were sharing that story, I was put in mind of this uh, relationship that I used to have with one of my very closest friends, somebody I've been friends with for a long time. And we would find ourselves in this battle from time to time over alleged facts yeah no, no no that's not what happened well yes it is here's what happened and we would get eyes popping veins bulging yep. and i would sit there and i would have this i could feel this compulsion it's like i can't let him have the last word right and at the same time there would be something way in the back of my mind going is this worth it <laughs> is this is this really worth it, it yeah yeah. My mine would be back there yelling, "Shut up! Yeah. Let it go. Shut up! Yeah. Don't it stop!" And I couldn't stop. But I can reflecting back now, though. Yeah, I can tell that there was a there was an energetic payoff that was feeling good. There was a yeah. buzz. Yeah. To that, I'm going to get you. Uh -huh. And my friend had to be having the exact same experience. Right. Because neither one of us was backing off. Right. And so I'm thinking somehow that that buzz payoff, that energetic payoff is tied to childhood trauma. Yes. And maybe you could go into that a little bit. It's like, how does that how did In, that happen to us as little kids that we would we would have that same energy? But in a completely different context. And now here it is 30 years later. I'm an ad I'm a college graduate. I understand history. I understand argumentation, and here I am still trying to wrestle somebody yeah. I care about and love to the floor, right, rather right. than go, "Okay, you're right." Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, my experience of that, the way I put it together, is I, I was um, in a environment that. I had to guess what the other person wanted. I had to posture in a way so it, or freeze. So I, I stuffed my ire, my rage, my what the hell's going on. I couldn't express that. Um, and in my needing to do that, it wasn't, I did it on purpose. That was a survival mechanism for me to survive my childhood. It was a built-in way that we can um, block off the emotional pain or the threat or the, I don't know, the, the I don't know what's going on. This is scary and yet not know how to protect ourselves. Cause, and we don't have guardians to, to lead us through the emotional upset to some kind of resolution like mirroring, I see you're afraid. I, I see you're angry i see you're frustrated right now and that frustration anger and got stuffed in and what it developed in me because i didn't stick up for myself or didn't know how to stick up for myself all the different times of humiliation ridicule or um, being the butt of somebody's jokes i built up a resentment and um, part of my recovery was learning that in my childhood I made vows like no one's ever going to do that to me again. I'm not going to do it. Da, 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 da. And I, that again goes subconscious. So I get into a, a conversation with somebody, like you say, a friend, and this trigger comes up. Don't be wrong. 
in fact, I'm, I'm, I am going to do whatever it takes to prove to you, based on the resentment I built up inside me about whatever that situation was, that you are now, you are now that person that did that to me because my subconscious doesn't know how to tell time. So I'm faced back, and now I'm six foot, 250 pounds, with a with an intellect and a wit, and you and a, become and a loud voice and a loud voice, and you become that person I'm going to get back, even though you may not even look like my dad, you may not look like my mother, you may not be the same gender, you become that, and I, I'm letting that resentment, bitterness, and contempt come out on you it's like one of my awarenesses was that the person i was in a relationship with say five foot five big brown eyes beautiful in this argument space she became this huge monster the emasculating monster person and i had to fight for my life and so i'm screaming and yelling at the person I say I love, but in this unresolved trauma, that person becomes that other person that inflicted the pain. I'm going to get you back. You deserve this. I'm going to hurt you as much as you hurt me. All subconscious. Also, I didn't know how to articulate that until after. In retrospect, I could see that I held a lot of resentment, bitterness, and contempt. And not dealing with it that comes out in the present moment um and i'm back in this um survival mode survival mode is fight flight freeze and that's usually where i went was the freeze because i was too small to protect myself or even know what to do uh or please so i get into this adrenaline and adrenaline's purpose is for my survival if I'm in an argument that the sky is blue or the sky is a tint of blue, some, you know, innocuous, I'm like, boom, I'm right here. And I'm not, I'm not backing down because you're going to pay. And this is all subconscious. That's what I mean by being right. Uh, I, I, at all costs, I am going to be right or at least not say I was wrong blame somebody else for my whatever I was thinking oh it wasn't my fault they told me somebody told me blame it on something else other than what do humans misperceive or misinterpret um, don't know everything <laughs> um, and we're, we're learning and now I understand that a dialogue with somebody who has a different experience actually grows me because they know things I don't know and, and I'm teachable now in my unre unresolved childhood trauma, I was not teachable. I didn't care. I needed to be right. And being wrong was some level of death sentence, ostracized. And for a small child, being ostracized is a death sentence. And the adrenaline, in order for me to survive, shuts down my emotional body so I can survive that moment so it's not I go away I blank out I um, disassociate um, and that's with physical pain because I've been in physical accidents car accidents where I don't remember any pain but uh, and that's my body's way of protecting me in the emotional trauma of my childhood raging father sometimes raging mother um, with no defense, I shut down um, and I become a, adrenalized. And um, my subconscious in the moment in this conversation is adrenalized and the subconscious does not tell time. So I am six foot, 250 pounds in the time space energy of a three year old trauma and don't know it so let's let's dig into that even more so okay. um can you can you share with us why that recurs what happens in that moment that three-year-old moment when uh we're adrenalized we're in freeze as you were saying as a likely reaction 
what is it about that experience that um, replicates itself over the years? What's missing for that little kid? What was missing for you? I think you hinted at it a few minutes ago, but let's let's look at that. Something prevents that. Some something's occurring. Um, essentially. I think what I'm getting at is there's a trauma occurring that is not getting healed, but instead it's getting uh, it's getting um, it's getting made permanent somehow. Well, it, it's initiating the experience of adrenaline of survival. So um, it's. Um, in the clinical terms, they call it disassociated or associated, associated to a traumatic event. Um, and I lose in that association to that traumatic event time in my past, I lose context in the present moment of self, situation, and the other person. It becomes life-threatening. Um, uh, an example I can give is coming home late from work. And my partner says in a not so gracious tone, where the hell have you been? And I, I'm i like, boom, back defending myself, um, posturing in a way, who the hell you think you're talking to? Um, I'm, I'm defending. I'm defending excuse me, I'm defending this image I created of what a man's supposed to be. Not who I am, but a, a man, perfection, production, presentation, tough, don't cry, um, don't get questioned, I'm the man of the house, I'm the boss, I'm, I'm the guy. And when that image is threatened, which is who I am, which is not who I think I am, not who I am, it associates back into that trauma that built the image man tough guy and i respond in a way to protect that image which is emotional attack verbal attack physical sometimes for me physical attack uh and which i now see as violence and um I, i'm i have not a clue as to anything that needed attention in my childhood it was all in the present moment um, and I use my rational brain to associate, like, sh if I'm the man of the house and tough, don't cry, and she's asking me a question that I don't think is appropriate, she's making me less. I'm losing that image, which is now who I am. So I have to pr bring that up and protect it, this image of tough guy, man of the house. Um, and I don't even know this, any of this is going on. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do, go to work. I, you know, I just went to the bar and had a couple of drinks. I deserve that. I work hard, you know. Um, and um, anything that threatens the idea of who I've become or who I should be becomes a death threat and I'm, I'm in a violent, posturing way. And the payoff is respect respect me don't ask questions that i don't that are uncomfortable for me to answer it's like no um and it's it's like i said we we could talk about this there's so many different things about this that are um it's complicated <coughs> complex post-traumatic stress disorder it's and we're, we're trying to piece take it apart a little by little given examples and yet it's so um immersed and entangled one of the things i did for healing was to own that image know that it was an image that it wasn't who i was that's who i needed to become to be in alignment with being a, a real man okay that's a context built on my socialization and trauma so now i so i readdress I, I look for who I am instead of the image of who I'm supposed to be. I don't know if this is making it more complicated. 
again, the payoff is I'm right. Don't mess with me. Get in line. Everything will be okay. Well, one thing that uh, I, I thought you might be going to is something that's been intriguing me throughout this whole conversation is and it refers to something you said way back at the beginning is that when that when we as little boys experience that trauma or those series of traumas, you said we didn't have anybody to help us get relief in right. a psychologically healthy way. Right. So not only did that trauma get buried into our, not just our psyche, but also into our brain neurological network in our brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is the other thing that I want, I want the newcomer to really appreciate is that the only way we could adapt and figure out the appropriate behaviors was from the very people that were causing us the trauma. Yeah. yeah. So we had no alternative. I had no alternative except to mirror, mirror or mimic my mimic. parents' behavior toward me. Right, right. So that exactly. as I got older, I would do the very things to other people. I may have said to myself, I'll never treat anybody that way. Correct. I'll never treat anybody the way you're treating me. And then I out. oh, guess what? Yeah. Because we did I didn't have any other input. There was no right. other input. There was just this input of these uh these these examples from our parents who themselves were probably suffering from complex PTSD from their own childhood. Right. Yes. Yes. So my father, I remember the first time I saw my father hitting my mother. And I, I remember like just shock trying to like figure out what was going on, seeing it happen. Now, in retrospect, that trauma or that those two types of behavior, one violent, the other one acquiescing to the violence. It seems to me that I picked the violence that seemed to be the best one. Now, I know that doesn't make sense, but something happened in my witnessing it that I made a determination or a, 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 I put it together somehow because I became just just like my father, loud, violent, emotionally, verbally. Um, I said uh, I didn't hit people, so I'm not like my father. But everything I did was in alignment with his behavior of using violence, emotional and verbal violence um, towards my mom. So I became, I actually became my father. Um, and like I said, this, we're, we're taking narrow bands of this complex uh, situation, dilemma, uh, trauma. Uh, another band is um, the resentment that built up in me as I went through my life without the capacity to set a healthy boundary, like becoming the butt of jokes, becoming a doormat or not knowing what to do or becoming the, the one that told the jokes, making somebody else the butt of my jokes, which created a lot of resentment inside me, this discordance. It wasn't in alignment with who I was, resentment towards those people that made me the butt of jokes, and then the the validation that okay, before they do that, I'm going to do it to them. I used to walk into a group of men because I was in the trades most of my life, well, half my not most of my life now, half of my life, um, and I would my thought was, which one of these dudes do I think I can beat up? I could take in a fight. Which one of these dudes I don't think I could take in a fight. And I would make friends with the ones I didn't think I could take because I wanted to be on the winning side. That was that was my system of survival. Um, and if somebody was ganging up on somebody else, a group of guys were, I would join the gang that's ganging up. And eventually I'd find myself that guy that other people are gang, ganging up on. And that, that caused a lot of discordance and fear and resentment and bitterness and contempt and um, I was, I witnessed a fight in the shop one time and I was standing next to a guy that was my, my, um, um, foreman and we watched the fight and 
um, I said, that was close. And he looked at me, Marty, and he said, you're, if I ever got, John, if I ever got in a fight with you, you're the kind of guy I would have to kill. And I, I'm looking at him, and in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. And I postured, I go, whoa, what do, you, what do you mean? He says, you're the kind of guy that if you ever started, you wouldn't know when to stop. You wouldn't know when you got it. You would just go too far. So I'd simply have to kill you. And there was two things that went on. I was like, yeah, you're right. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. And the other one was, what the hell? What? Um, and I knew what he was saying was true. That, and the reason I wasn't in a lot of physical altercations, because I knew I didn't, I, I will, I didn't want to hurt. I really knew I could hurt somebody and I didn't want to hurt people. So, um, and that's an example of unresolved, the result of unresolved childhood trauma in my experience as a man. Um, and, and the demographic I was in, which was, um, craft shop, you know, a bunch of men that, knew how to do a, a certain type of job. At that time, I was a heating and air conditioning. I've been carpenter, and, but they're all, we all have a set of roles and we know. Jordan Peterson said, when two men get together, and this is an example of what we're talking about, they know that in any conversation, the bottom line is one of us could get hurt. Bottom line, two men get together, we know that. Two women get together, that's not a consideration. But two men get together? No, the bottom line is, depending on the severity of the situation, somebody might get hurt. The last draw, the last part that it, both of us are willing to go to is some kind of physical altercation. And I, uh, I, was that, I was that guy. I would, uh, I would suggest that when two women get together, the possibility is one of us is going to get hurt emotionally. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Not, not physically, yeah. but. Uh, right, right. Our time is uh, our time is uh, coming to an end here, and I, I just want to so thank you so much for uh, all that information. And I want to just summarize for again for the newcomer: we're dealing with a, kit, a condition that most human beings go through, and right. that is uh, complex post uh, par complex PTSD. That right. is a series of events that happen to us as children that create trauma that never gets healed. Right. And unhealed trauma has to go somewhere and it goes into the body and it goes into the body in two forms, into the neurology of the brain. It becomes part of our brain structure and or it goes into the body physically and ultimately becomes some kind of chronic illness. We didn't talk about that, but that's, right, another, right. Yeah. that's another potential outcome for this unresolved trauma. And as we're talking about, it has a payoff. It has an emotional payoff for it.